Hello, and welcome to the Cisco Support Community Expert Series webcast on Cisco Data Center Overlays with focus on virtual extensible local area network VXLAN. A few housekeeping notes to begin. As you enter the WebEx console, you either join us via audio broadcast or by the phone, which was automatically muted. Because of our large audience today, you will, re -muted, muted, you will remain muted throughout the event. When you have a question, please feel free to enter it on the WebEx Q&A panel located in the bottom right corner of the console. Please leave the chat window available to communicate with the WebEx facilitator for any problems or issues you might experience during today's event. We will appreciate your feedback on today's event by taking the short survey that appears when you close your browser at the end of the event. That is very, very important to us. My name is Monica Lewis. I am a Communities Lead for the Cisco Support Community, and I will be moderating today's event. The Cisco Support Community is an online forum with over 700,000 members where you can get answers to your technical questions prior to opening cases with the TAC organization. You can answer any question on the community or contribute and write documents, videos, discussions, and blogs. The community can help you boost your career by becoming a top contributor and getting the technical community to know about your expertise. We invite you to participate at supportforums.cisco.com, and the link is in the chat. We have you as the experts and webcast events that are posted on the event area on the Cisco Support Community, and you can browse to the events area with the link posted on the chat. If you haven't already, then be sure to join the Cisco Support Community just by logging in with your Cisco.com credentials, where you can share current real-world technical support knowledge to your peers and experts. Check out our, uh, our class of the 2015 Top Event Contributors and Spotlight Awardees uh, for the Cisco Support Community. If you are interested in becoming a uh, top contributor, uh, just check the link on the chat. Take a moment to rate the content of your peers, documents, questions, videos, and blogs. In doing so, you'll help us to recognize the wonderful content that they, the people contribute. Rating encourages contributions, and we highly appreciate your contributions. So you can, you can read more about ratings in this link in the chat. And now on to today's presentation. Our expert joining us today is Vishal Mera. Vishal is a technical marketing engineer with the Cisco Data Center Competitive Insights team based in San Jose, California. Previously, he was working as a customer support engineer for the Data Center Server Virtualization TAC team for the past four years, with a primary focus on data center technologies such as Nexus F5000, Cisco UCS, Cisco Nexus 1000V, and virtualization. Vishal is a triple CCIE in routing and switching, service providers, and data center. He has been an ongoing presenter at Cisco Live in Orlando 2013, Milan 2014, and San Francisco in 2014, as well as he has given a few presentations here at the Cisco support community. Welcome, Vishal. After the event, Michelle will continue with the conversation with you, and if you have any more questions after the event, you will be able to ask them to Michelle in the Ask the Expert session that it opens to today up to October 30th. So don't miss that opportunity to ask questions if you, if you don't have any questions today. If you want to download the presentation, for this for for today's event you can do it in in the link in the chat and you are also able to uh, 
you are also able to get a copy of the presentations. The recording of this presentation will be available on the Cisco Support Committee as soon as we are able to process it. In. And so check in, check in by next week to see uh, the recording, the FAQ document, and everything related to this event. And the link, uh, you can bookmark it, it is on the chat. We encourage you to submit your questions to the, to the event so that we can follow, follow through uh, the presentation. During our live presentation, you may be able to submit the questions to our expert, and Vishal will be able to answer them verbally at the end of the presentation. When the webcast closes, please take a moment to fill out the survey. Now let's let's get in before we we start. Let's get into the first polling question. The first polling question is: Are you planning to implement VXLAN in your network? You can answer yes, no, or is still evaluating. Please answer the the polling questions to give Vishal an opportunity to tailor the presentation to your needs. And now let me hand over the mic to Vishal for today's event. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's session, taking your time to learn more about VXLAN. Uh, once I get the polling survey, I will, I will start with the presentation. Uh, just wanted to get the gauge of uh, what the customers are thinking in implementing VXLAN. And if you have any, uh, if your answer is no or still evaluating, and if you need more information on that, feel free to use Ask the Expert to ask me any questions, and I can give you the feedback or the pointers on to help you to decide on VXLAN implementation. So I see most of you have uh, are still evaluating. I hope this presentation helps you to get more insights on VXLAN and help you with your analysis for the VXLAN. So let's get started. Uh, today's session is going to be on data center overlays. Uh, with, I will first go through why we need overlays, what are the different overlays attributes, and then why VXLAN fits in for as a best choice for the overlay, uh, how VXLAN has evolved from its first initial stages of implementation till current date, uh, how VXLAN can be also used for other use cases uh, which can help for connecting your data centers. And I will uh, go through the different deployment scenarios depending upon what uh, network you have, and then we can see how you can deploy VXLAN on top of it. Finally, there will be a comparison of different modes of VXLAN, and uh, also, how the VXLAN, which is using BGP as an open standard, uh, how it can be used across your vendors. So the main reason is, why do we need overlays? Uh, overlays, traditional behavior has been that your device gets an IP address, and that IP address also defines its location. If the device moves, it needs to have a new IP address, and thereby it gets a new location. And with the new IP location, you need to update your, not only your end device, but the method and the protocols in getting to the end device. So there's a lot of changes that happens because once the device moves, its identity gets changed, it's a new device on the network, and to have cross connections with your existing on-premises data center with your device, which was moved to the cloud or a new data center to bridge them or to link them, you need to have implement different protocols. Now, or it, traditionally, we have been dealing with this problem of change in the location and identity. With, with, the, need, with the OLAs, you can resolve that issue uh, by preserving the same IP address, preserving the same identity, only the location pointer gets changed. And we have been uh, using different OLAs, uh, such as lists, or LISP, OTV, and so on to address this uh, specific uh, need for the OLA. But 
even though this protocol exists, uh, VXN suits better to address the challenges that comes with the overlays, and that's what our session is going to be focused on. Uh, before we dive in further to VX9, let's quickly revise what are the different overlay attributes, what is how the overlay is structured. So for any overlay to work, <coughs> uh, you need to have a, a strong uh, connected underlay network, which is your end devices, routers, switches, and host, which are which is your base fabric, which connects on, on top of it, which you implement your overlay. So you need to have um, a protocol which bridges your switches and routers together uh, for the underlay network. It has its own control plane uh, to manage your under, uh, underlay switches and routers. You have your edge devices, which are the connecting points to bring in your host and virtual machines to the network. On top of it, you have an overlay where you have the overlay uh, protocol which mask the underlay network for endpoints to assume that they are on the same network. So this is where the overlay control plane comes into picture. Uh, for VXN terminology, we use VTAPs, which are the tunneling endpoints, which bridges your end host over the underlay using an overlay control plane. So you have a identifier, which is the VNID, uh, similar to VLAN ID. You have, for VXN, you have VTAP, the tunneling endpoints. You have the virtual network instance, which is the service service, and then you have your edges, your host, which does um, the network virtualization. There are different attributes for overlay, uh, though they are classified as service, edge device, and signaling. How, what type of overlay service you need, how you're going to implement it, and what is the signaling going to be used. So for layer two and layer three, it's similar to having uh, evaluating a LAN segment or basing it on different IP subnets. When you use a layer two overlay, you're just bridging on a single subnet. Uh, it, it does expose to the layer two flooding. However, with the layer three, you can have a full mobility regardless of the subnets. It gives you the opportunity to connect your different segments and uh, mimic a layer two environment for your different host sitting in a different environment, different subnets, different data centers. It does not, uh, it, the, the good part about the layer three overlay is that it, it, it contains your network failures, it minimizes your flooding, and hybrid layer two, layer three overlay offers the best of both the worlds, it, and that's what the VXLAN brings into the hybridness of having your underlying overlay integrated. So for when, depending upon how you implement, there are two options, host overlays, which is uh, the VXLAN overlay responsibilities at the host, uh, at the end devices, and the network overlays is where you use your networking protocols. So traditional VPNs, OTV, VPLS, Fabric Path can be considered as a network overlays because we have the VXN is achieved or the overlay is achieved through those protocols. The host overlay is where the virtualization comes into play, VXN and VGRE, where the end devices, the host, are masked from underlay plane. They, it basically, it, it drives on top of your underlay network. Hybrid overlay is where you have the both physical and virtual, and I've listed VXLAN again here because with, with Cisco portfolio and even with under, other peers, uh, VXLAN is now possible both at the end device as well as at the networking devices. And the signaling, how do you, how do you have your control plane, uh, the OLA signaling achieved? Uh, there are two ways of doing that, data plane and control plane learning. So data plane learning is where you don't have any centralized controller or central database which, which gives
gives you OLA signaling. So you need to rely on multicast or you need to have source learning. Fabric Path is an example. It requires uh, flooding. You need to have flooding for the data plane signaling. For control plane, it's more uh, protocol oriented or it could be a controller oriented. For a controller, uh, you can have a central database like uh, Nexus 1000B or from uh, Nuage, you can have a controller or from VMware NSX, you can have a controller. ACI is also one of the examples where it is a controller based. Protocol based is where you are using BGP, ISS, LISP. And on top of the protocols, there is a one more way of achieving the control plane signaling that is through push and pull. BGP is the push, mo push met, uh, model where it once it learns the endpoint devices, it will push the database to all the participating VTAPs. So modern data uh, center fabric seeks a well-integrated overlay and underlay. If your underlay is not uh, well robust, and you deploy a overlay on top of it and you have issues, the troubleshooting becomes very difficult. You need to have a strong, resilient fabric to have a, a proper overlay networking on top of it. So current data center fabric is looking for a solution which can have both layer two and layer three, both robust underlay and overlay solution. ACI fits a perfect example in this, but our session is more focused on open standard VXLAN BGP VPN. So I'll be focusing more on that rather than focusing on a specific controller based solution. So what do we need in data center fabric? We need workload mobility, we need workload placement, segmentation, scaling, both physical and virtual integration, network virtualization. It should have uh, automation and programmability capabilities as well as it should be open. So based on that, our data center fabric journey in Cisco has been originally we used to have spanning tree as a protocol between uh, switches. Then we came up with VPC where you have multiple uh, links active active. Then we came with the fabric path which was a true data center fabric where all links were active active. Then we had a DFA solution which used fabric path and BGP. We had a VXLAN then which was originally relying on multicast. And then, with, then we came with VXLAN eVPN where it's a BGP open standard based uh, VXLAN eVPN control plane. We also have ACI, but since the focus is on VXLAN, uh, that fabric is not listed here. So with, with different overlay parameters and with so many options available, such as VXLAN, Fabric Path, MPLS, and to note that this technology existed way before VXLAN was introduced. So which encapsulation to use? And with, with such design question, it already it always depends on what are your end goals or what is available to you. But if you are, if you already have an existing network and you want to deploy a VXLAN on top of it, or you want to have a new greenfield environment, then the VXLAN is the choice of the encapsulation that will address all the needs of yours. And it gives you the fabric that you need to have a proper overlay integration. So the choice is VXLAN. And the reason are, and this session will now go through the reasons why the VXLAN is a proper choice. It's a standard based. It gives you up to 16 million identifiers compared to VLAN was only 4,000. It leverages layer three CMP, so all links are forwarding. Unlike uh, spanning tree where we had, we had to cut down the links to minimize or not to have any flooding. VXLAN, which will allow you to have all links forwarding in your uh, data center. It, is, it also integrates your physical and virtual nodes, and it gives you a scalability to extend your data center across the cloud, across geographic locations. Uh, with the VXLAN network virtualization is, is possible. It, it 
runs on IP routing. It's proven, IP routing, as we know, is proven, stable, scalable. VXLAN can work with any routing protocols, OSPF, EHRP. It can use all available bandwidth that you have in your fabric. From overlay point of view, it's a standard based. It gives you layer two extension and mobility. It has multi-tenancy. Because of BGP VPN, you can use VRF, and VRF allows you to have multi-tenants, even with overlapping IP addresses. And it's a scalable network domain. So you can have your, you have your IP transport network, which is your control plane. And then at the LAN segment, you have a VTAP, which tunnels your IP transport network with your LAN segment. VTAP, um, it's basically this is what is used as the endpoint to tunnel across your transport IP network to bridge or to route your different local LAN segments. So it has two interfaces, one where it connects you to the transport IP network, and the other end of it is sitting on the local LAN segment. One good thing about VXLAN is no matter what you have encapsulation point uh, on your host devices, VLAN, VXLAN, and VGRE, that gets masked when the packet is bridged or routed in the VXLAN fabric. So no matter you have any other encapsulation, like you have any traditional networks which you now want to bridge, or you have a choice of, uh, you have a preference to use a particular encapsulation at your endpoints, it does not matter with VXLAN, you can mask that and encapsulate it in the VXLAN fabric. All this is pos possible with just 50 additional bytes. Uh, the original layer two uh, frame is, uh, is added on to uh, with additional headers with VXLAN header, which gives you the 24 bits of VNI, which is 16 million different uh, local LAN segments. You have your UDP header, which has your um, VXLAN port, source port. You have your outer IP header, which gives you the VTAP uh, IP address and the MAC address. And you can have uh, the next hop MAC address, depending upon whether it's a routed segment or whether you are going to bridge in the VXLAN. So all this, uh, you have to use UDP 4789 port. Um, I have heard that uh, there is going to be an option to have different UDP ports, but from the standard point of view, you need to use UDP 4789. So in case if you need to take care of any firewall or any uh, ACLs, you need to allow this port. So with just additional 50 bytes, uh, you get uh, 16 million uh, local segments compared to VLN, uh, VLAN, which has only 4,000. Different terminologies for VXLAN, uh, you have layer two, layer three gateway, layer two gateway which bridges between VLAN and VXLAN. Layer three gateway is one which routes across different VNIs. Anycast gateway, you can program same MAC and same subnet. So whenever uh, end device moves, it, it does not need to ARP for its gateway again. It's programmed with the same MAC and the, and the gateway IP. And anytime it moves, the its local VTAP is going to be its gateway. So that's one good thing that is possible with BGP VPN. Layer two VNI is when you have mapping of VLAN with VXLAN. Layer three VNI is when you want to route between different VNIs. And VRF or VLAN, this is what allows you to have uh, multiple tenants uh, with unique or overlapping IP address. So from overview point of, uh, for, from VXLAN point of view, you will have your IP network, you will have your edge devices, which bridges your end host, physical host, virtual host, and these edge devices will have an IP interface, uh, which is a VTAP in VXLAN terminology. So VTAP is the one, uh, whenever it needs to bridge across the IP network, that will be used as the source and destination IP address. And the routing is just basic routing as it happens in normal routing scenario. The routing will take place on basis of VTAP IP addressing and encapsulation is carried over in that IP packet. So as I mentioned, you have with VXLAN, 
layer two and layer three gateway, uh, VXN into VLAN bridging, and VXN into X routing is done by layer three gateway. So Cisco portfolio has variety of uh, switches and routers that can support all possible solutions with VXLAN. Uh, we have functionality of layer two, layer three gateway, BGP, VPN, Anycast gateway, and header replication, which is also known as ingress replication. This session is more focused on Nexus 9000 uh, in the standalone mode to walk over different VXLAN solutions. All that I have mentioned so far, layer two, layer three gateway, BGP, VPN, Anycast, head and replication, all that is possible with Nexus 9000. Other platforms has a combination, uh, but as of today, Nexus 9000, ASR 9000, Nexus 7000, um, F3 line card, and I believe Nexus 3000 also can have all these functionalities. If you have any questions on specific product, feel free to use Ask the Expert to ask me any questions on which product supports which VXN solution. But again, I will repeat Nexus 9000 in standalone mode has all of, all of the features uh, possible with VXN. So Nexus 9000, uh, just a quick overview, it, it does traditional VPC fax, can also do VXN bridging and routing. And in ACI mode, it can be used for ACI, uh, ACI uh, infrastructure, which is policy model automation and so on. So VXLAN has evolved. It was, when it was introduced, it was a data plane only, where it was multicast based flood and learn. Not a lot of customers were uh, uh, comfortable in using multicast in their IP fabric. Also it was flooding and learn, so uh, they did not like that idea. But still it was, it picked up very well uh, in overlay solution. Then came the VXLAN for scalable data center fabric, which you have two different pods in your same data center and that could be connected, bridged using VXLAN. Uh, it used unicast head and replication so that you can minimize on your flooding and learn, as well as uh, it could now also does PGP EVPN, so a scalable control plane, and you can completely get rid of multicast. And in future, we have already started seeing this, but in future, you'll be seeing the excellent more for interconnecting your data centers, which are geographically separated, uh, connecting with the clouds, that is where the VXLAN will be used in future. So let's go through the journey of VXLAN. It was multicast based. You have your VTEX participating in that multicast group for a specific BNI. It was data driven, no, no central control plane, no controller or control plane uh, protocols. And multicast was used for any unknown traffic. So the way it would work is your participating VTEPs would join a test uh, a multicast group address. And whenever a new host or virtual machine is discovered on that specific BNI, the, for example, in ARP learning, uh, ARP process, when the host wants to ARP for uh, other host, it will send the frame to the VTEP. The VTEP will send it to the multicast group. And whichever VTEPs on the other end are participating in that multicast group will, will receive the packet. At the same time, they will update their entries for well, what that MAC address that they have learned, what is the corresponding VNI, and which VTEP to reach it back. And then it gets forwarded within their segment as a, a normal broadcast. And the device which, for which the app request was done will respond back. On its way back, it's not flooded to the entire network. It only goes directly because here the Vita V2 has already learned where MAC A is. So it will unicast that frame back to V1 and its table will now be updated. So in, if you have, so the good part about here in multicast is that only if the Vita is participating in that VNI, it will receive the multicast frame. If it is not participating, then it won't be sent that the ARP request packet. So 
So here in this case, a multicast packet is not forwarded to V2 because it does not participate in, in that VNI. You can have multiple VNIs masked to the same multicast group because you don't have 16 million multicast addresses. But because of the unique VNI, you can still have multiple VNIs um, part of the same multicast group. And just like before, the, now the packet from V3 will go directly to V1 because it already knows where Mac X belongs and which we tap to reach it. So now since the table is updated using multicast, the actual packet data packet forwarding will, will go directly in unicast mode. The host will send uh, the VTAP V1 will see where the MACB belongs and it knows to reach V2. The normal routing will happen in, in the IP fabric and the packet will be sent across and then device will get the packet. Similarly, um, on the return, once the MAC table and the addresses are updated in the host devices, the packet will flow directly uh, across the VTABs without any further multicast packets for learning. In this case, I'm showing that the, the they are on a different, um, in this case, I'm showing that the V2 does not participate in the multicast for this VNI 30001. So this was the first phase of VXLAN where it was completely dependent on multicast to learn end devices. So the next step or evolution of VXLAN was to get rid of multicast, at least for, for flooding, or whenever there is a unknown packet, for, for example, ARP request. So the announcement was that instead of using multicast uh, to avoid flood and learn, we are going to use head and replication where the one source VTAP will do replication in the hardware and it will send a unicast packet to each participating VTAPs. So for a small scale VXLAN, this would scale, but if you can, if you're going to have more uh, end devices and you need to have this replication, it's a lot of duplication packets, especially when you don't know if the device, the end device is sitting on that VTAP or not. So in this case, there is a ARP request for Mac B coming from Mac A, and VTAP V1 will send a unicast packet to each of the participating uh, VTAPs, and eventually the broadcast will reach the end device, and it will send the packet back in the unicast mode to the V1. So time for a second poll, uh, and this comes from a conversation I had with uh, one of the customers for Nexus 1000V. So I'll tell you that story after the, I see the polling results. Is the thought of using BGP protocol for extension of layer two segment in data center switching? A scary thought. Um, for BGP expert, the answer would be no, it's not scary, it's, it's doable. For traditional switching guys, or BGP in layer two domain, that, that would freak them out. So, what is your um, what is your thought? Is it yes or no? I'm just waiting for the poll results to show up. Wow, so we have a we have a mixed answer. We have um audience saying that, yes, it's a scary thought, and no, and this is what I expected, because we have a mix of expertise in our network engineering team, where 
Some are very familiar with BGP implementation. They do that day in, day out, and some of them are purely focused on data center switching that using BGP or a thought of using BGP scares them. And I had a conversation with the customer back when I was in TAC, and he wanted to scale his Nexus 1000V, and I told him, you need to use BGP VPN. And he said, yeah, but Nexus 1000V is a pure layer to switching. It does not even support OSPF. Then how would it support BGP? And that's the common misconception that we have. Uh, BGP is, we are not using it as a routing protocol, but we are using it as a control plane protocol to connect your two Nexus 1000V segments and make them exchange the data that they have uh, regarding to their specific VXLAN domains. So if you want to scale your Nexus 1000V, all you need is to give a control interface and IP address, make them both reachable, and then you can exchange your VXLAN. I understand it's uh, it's a little bit a uh, unique way of doing this, but it's trust me, the BGP is the best way to go about when it comes in scaling VXLAN segments. It's proven, it's, this, is, this is how our internet works. So it's a proven technology which will help to in data center switching as well. So quick overview of MP BGP. It has been used for a very long time now with MPLS. It, re it reduces flooding, it is a scalable, it, it has a lot of extensions that can help in uh, overlay solution. And it also gives you the forwarding for both layer two and layer three. So it solves both the problems using BGP VPN. And we'll dive in further with BGP VPN. So basically all you have to do is you already have the VTABs on your end devices. You use BGP to have discover the VTAPs and also to know the MAC address and IP address. And all this is done through very limited commands. You don't need to be master of BGP to implement BGP VPN VXLAN. Standard few commands, standard template, no matter how many VTAPs you have, no matter how many big your network is. Once you have that template and once it does not even only need to scale is the more tenants you add, the more route tag and route distinguisher you need to uh, design. And a Nexus 9000 also gives you the option to have auto RD and RT values, so you don't need to even um, track those or need to design that upfront. So BGP VPN solution, simple to implement, standard few commands that you need to know. It helps you to discover the VTAPs as well as the end host MAC and IP addresses. You can have a route reflector on the spine. If you don't want to do that, then you can have uh, any other box working as a route reflector. And there are a lot of different BGP uh, configuration options that you can do. You can have eBGP e between the spine and the leaf, or you can have iBGP between spine and the leaf. So this is what eVPN, Ethernet VPN, and it's a standard based and it has the provision for network virtualization overlay. So that will help for any other tunnel tunneling overlay, um, overlay solution such as VXLAN, NVGRE, MPLS over Ethernet. And this is what is being used for BGP VPN solution in VXLAN. It's a Swiss Army knife, eVPN. It, it it gives you active active with VPC on Nexus. It, authenticates your endpoints so with the current thing going on in security at the data center, eVPN has inbuilt security. It reduces your flooding, it replaces your multicast, and it gives you layer two and layer three mobility. So with distributed any cast gateway. So all the advantages that you want for scalable control plane VXN solution that is provided by BGP VPN, open-based solution, you don't need to rely on any specific controller to implement your VXN solution. So the way it works is similar topology that we have seen. The only difference is now that instead of using your regular IP network with OSPF or EIGRP, now you are on top of it, you are running IBGP between your end host, uh, between your end devices and route reflector. So basically when you have your VTAPs, 
are advertised, they know about through BGP configuration. Once a new device comes up on that v, VXN segment, the v, v, uh, the VTAP will advertise those host routes, IP and MAC, within the control plane. So as soon as I learn a new virtual machine or a physical host coming on my network, that local VTAP will advertise it to the route reflector. This is same as multicast, where multicast, as soon as you learn, you have you learn it through ARP uh, or any other uh, packet which end device will send. The VTAP will learn it and it will send it to the multicast. But it, the difference comes here where in, in multicast, you need to have end-to-end -end communication happening to, to make the entire network aware of that host device. Whereas in BGP, as soon as you learn it, you send it to a route reflector, and route reflector will propagate that to all the VTAPs participating in that BGP solution. So this is where the difference comes in. This is inbuilt control plane without relying on anything else. So once the VTAP learns it, it updates its table, it sends it to a route reflector, and route reflector will then propagate the host to all of the VTAPs. So you have your VTAP discovery and your end host discovery done with the help of BGP. Now, since you have the table built in, it, this is how it will help to suppress the ARP flooding. Because now every VTAP knows about every end device uh, in its corresponding VNI and its corresponding next hop. So as soon as I get a ARP request from my virtual machine or physical host going to a, a different end device, my VTAP already has the MAC and IP table. So it, it won't send a flooding traffic across the network. This is how the host advertisement would look like from a BGP perspective. It will tell you the VNI that it belongs, the layer three VNI in case it needs routing, it needs to send on a different VNI. What is the next hop IP value? So other VTAPs would know how to reach this MAC and particular IP of the end device. And what is the encapsulation? So number three is where VXLAN comes in. And the sequence number is zero. So sequence number, if you are, so if you have a V, if you need to do a V motion of your virtual machine and it goes from VTAP V1 to VTAP V3, as soon as VTAP V3 would learn this new virtual machine, it will send an update to route reflector and it will update the sequence value from zero to one. So when the new update comes from route reflector to V1, it would know that, okay, my end device has moved. The sequence is now updated from zero to one. It will flush out the table and it will rewrite or it will remark its table with the correct next hop IP value. So in this case, V1, once this MAC A moves from V1 to V3, it will update that to reach this MAC, I need to go through IP V3. So this is how BGP VPN would facilitate in host advertisement as well as host mobility. And in each, uh, you can, with the show command, you can see that specific details on that IP value. It tells you how it is reached, what is the MAC A and the IP value, what is the encapsulation for um, it has received two labels, 30,000 and 50,000. One is for the layer two VNI, the other is for layer three VNI. And the corresponding VTAP value where it could be reached. Host moves, this is what I was talking about. Once your host moves from V1 to V3, the sequence will get updated as well as the next hope value will get updated. So all the entire network would know that now to reach the specific MAC, we need to go through V3 and not through V1. In the same output now with the different values, what encapsulation, it still shows VXLAN, it shows IPv3 and the MAC and IP address. ARP suppression, because we have already learned the entire network, all the end devices, virtual machines, we, need, we don't need to, the VTAPs won't need to forward the ARP request in the network. 
the ARP with the, in this scenario, a host A sends an ARP request for IPB, and Vven already has that in the table, so it will respond back with the MAC for IPB. On in the scenario where you don't have a MAC learned by the participating VTAPs. I'm showing you a multicast. So when I introduce VGP VPN, I said we are getting rid of multicast. And now on our handling for where I don't have a MAC address, I'm showing that I'm using multicast. So there are two options with VGP VPN. Some customers would like to use still multicast only for flooding when in this scenario where the Mac is not learned at all, or the end device is not known to the network at all. But with Nexus 9000 and also with BGP VPN, it's possible to get rid of multicast and also use just unicast. So there is no need to use multicast for this specific scenario. You can still rely on unicast. In unicast case, Whichever VTAP is participating in that VNI, the V1 will send a unicast packet to those VTAPs. The reason I'm showing multicast is to, to give you an option to use both unicast and multicast. You can still use multicast, and some customers want to use multicast because it's scalable. If you have hundreds of VTAPs in your network, it's better to use multicast for this specific scenario than relying on unicast. But again, with BGP VPN, for this specific scenario, you don't need to use multicast. You can still continue to use unicast for unknown device, which so far does not exist on the network. So in this case, um, a host A wants to talk with the host B, and the packet was forwarded using multicast. The ARP request reached host P and the host P responded back. And now it will be a unicast packet. Also, it will go through a route reflector. So in this case, now in future, if any other VTAP wants to talk with that host P, they don't need to use, rely on multicast. They can, because the route reflector updated entire network, Every everyone knows about the host P now. So. Limited use of multicast, and thanks to route reflector, it, the unknown devices, once they are learned, will be propagated to entire network, which is not possible when you're using just multicast mode. So in this case, now we are doing, uh, I'm showing you a packet forwarding where I'm just bridging, bridging on the same VNI. So I get a packet from host A, it wants to go through host B, we even will see what is the VNI and how to reach the next hop. It will bridge the packet using the correct VNI 30,000. V2 gets it. It sees that MACB belongs, it's a local. It, it will have the interface entry and it will send it on that interface. In this case, when I need to route from MAC A to MAC F, the packet will be sent to the gateway and V1 will see that, okay, I need to send this packet on a different VNI. So it will send it on VNI 50,000. You can see the packet will have VNI ID of 50,000. The orig original packet will be uh, still preserved. Once V2 gets it, it will look up in 50,000. It will strip the packet, overlay packet, and it will see that, it will see that the Mac F resides locally and it will send that packet. So in routing, you, you use a VRF, or additional VNI ID for routing. When you're bridging, you bridge on the same VNI, just like we do in regular bridging and routing in VLAN. Just listing a few advantages which I've already gone through. It gives you multi-tenant solution because of use of VRF. It leverages BGP, uh, MP BGP, to give you layer three VPN characteristics. It's scalable, it's the advertisement point of view. You don't need to rely on multicast. It converges faster, it propagates the information faster. It's an industry standard protocol for to work with multi-vendor. It uses host-based forwarding 
uh, VXLAN, primary characteristics of VXLAN is that it's host-based. And as I mentioned, you can do head-end replication for uh, devices which were not learned before. Uh, you can use a VTAP peer authentication, which makes your fabric more secure, and you have an ARP suppression. The next evolution in a VXLAN was that it gives you multi-tenancy because of the VRF. So I, I covered BGP uh, EVPN in vanilla uh, flavor. The next is on IP services where you can have distributed any cast gateway. You don't need to reprogram your host, your end device with the new gateway once it moves from one VTAP to other VTAP. You get VXN routing, which is possible because of Nexus 9000 uh, a6, and you have multi-tenancy. So in traditional uh, network, the layer three boundary was at the spine or at the aggregation point. And with, with the use of layer two, layer three fabric, now you can shift your layer three boundary at the access level. So in the traditional network, the scalability becomes an issue and layer two, layer three overlay net fabric you get enhanced forwarding and you get IP mobility. So with the layer two, layer three fabric, you first route and then bridge when necessary. You, in a traditional network, you always need to bridge. And if you need to route, then you send the packet all the way at the layer three boundary, which is your spine. Any cost gateway, uh, the BGP VPN, it's possible to have uh, distributed IP uh, gateway, where you configure each and every VTAP with the same MAC and IP address at the SVI. So whenever the host moves, it has the same, it knows that its default gateway is going to have the same MAC address. And our Nexus 9000 uh, config guide goes in detail on how to configure different VXLAN solutions, multicast based, BGP based, and even IP anycast gateway. So with, uh, did not come proper, okay. And there's, uh, the graphics are not proper on the PowerPoint, but uh, what I'm trying to show you is that you, for any cast gateway, when you have, uh, when you need to route between the different VXLAN, you, the packet comes from SVIA, it will be, which belongs to VNIA, and if I need to send it to VNIP, I will route it to VNI X, which is, and then once the receiving VTAB receives that packet on VNI X, it will strip that. It will know that the packet now needs to go to VXLAN or VNI B, and it will route it, it will bridge it accordingly. So first the routing will happen, and then the bridging at the remote peer. So in, in case of bridging, you get your VLANs are stretched. So you have your two VTABs, they have two VLANs, um, which could be same or which could be different. That does not matter. As long as the subnet is on the same, they're on the same subnet, you can have different VLAN IDs across the VTAPs. And because it's on the same VNI, the packet will come, will be bridged from VLAN A to VNI A, and then it will be bridged back from VNI A to VLAN A. So it's, this is a pure bridging scenario where your two end devices, your end host, are sitting on same subnet, but a different VLAN, but they are sitting on the same VNI. So that's the purpose of VXLAN, that you bridge two different segments with the same VNI value. In, and I'm showing now how the bridging will work for when you have distributed IP anycast gateway. So physical uh, machine one will send ARP request and first it will always send it for its default gateway if it has not already done. So as soon as this packet comes to its local VTAP, that will get propagated across the network because of BGP, EVP, and route reflector. So every once this physical machine sends the original app request for its default gateway, entire network learns about that machine. The VTAP will respond with its, with its MAC address 
And this is the standard behavior that we see in regular VLAN networks. Now, VM1 will send VM1, a virtual machine, would like to talk with the physical machine one. It will send the ARP request for physical machine one. Since, and with this, again, the entire fabric will learn where the virtual machine one resides. And in the previous walk, we saw that the VTAP where VM1 belongs has already learned the physical machine one MAC address. So it already knows about it. And that's where the ARP suppression comes into play. With this, both the devices are end devices are learned, and we virtual machine one will now be able to talk with virtual machine two. So from the packet work point of view, it comes on virtual machine wants to send now packet to a data packet to physical machine one. It comes on VLAN 123. The local VTAP know where to send across. It will get uh, bridged in the fabric using VNI 10,000. The remote peer gets it and it sends the packet to the physical machine. For routing, as I uh, uh, showed this earlier, if you want to route between two different sub subnets, you send it from VNI, which, to which that VLAN belongs. You, you, you route it to VNI X. Once the packet receives to the remote peer, gets bridged, it goes to the cross, it will send to the H4. H4 will send it back. It gets routed again on VNI X, and then it gets bridged. So this is symmetric bridging and routing. You, you follow the same functions both at the source and the destination VTAP. It gets routed and it gets bridged. So in this scenario where I'm routing, I'm not doing bridging anymore. I, am, I have virtual machine one and physical machine two on different subnets. So in this case, I will need to route. Same discovery happens. Everyone knows about virtual machine one now. It will send the packet to the default gateway. It's coming from uh, VLAN 123. It goes to the tower. The tower will send it to with a VNI of 50,000. It will get routed in the fabric. It comes to the remote destination. It gets stripped off of the overlap header, and it goes routes to the. It get it then gets bridged to the proper VLAN. So VLAN to VNI, and then routing at the VNI level, and then again bridging from VNI to VLAN level. And I guess uh, once you get the slides, those will be in, in PDF mode. If you want to have a packet walkthrough in PowerPoint, please send me an email, and I will send only those slides where, where the animation of packet walkthrough is there. So what we discuss in VXN evolution is we had unicast mode then, uh, sorry, we had the multicast mode where it was flood and learn. We introduced head and replication to use only unicast. Then we switched to protocol learning to have BGP VPN to minimize or remove the multicast use and use a control plane without using any external controllers. We then introduced VXLAN gateways, layer two, layer three gateways. And finally, VXN routing with distributed IP gateways. Uh, Monica, uh, there is an issue in forwarding the slide. Okay. Thank you. Um, so now I'll quickly go through VXLAN designs. I know I'm at the top of the hour. Uh, so VXLAN design, whenever you want to design your VXLAN, you need to have, you need to know what are your considerations, whether you want to use flood and learn or eVPN, whether you want to use multicast application or unicast mode, whether you have existing network, which is brownfield, or you're deploying a new network, greenfield. Is it a multi-vendor environment? Is what you're considering to use Cisco with other um, other industry vendors? The scalability point of view, how many IP, MAC, 
addresses you are planning to have in your network, how many VNIs, VTAP peers you're going to have. This scalability information you can always find from specific product. Uh, every product has a scalability guide where all this is listed. So you might have a brownfield. I will quickly walk through this. You have your existing network and you want to bridge. Using VXLAN, you can use uh, a VXLAN interport extension. You're connecting two data centers ports, which is a brownfield scenario. You can also have within the pod, you can have, or sorry, within the data center, you will have a different pods which you want to bridge or we want to extend the layer two segment and you can use VXLAN over there. For green field, you can use IBGP, MPIBGP uh, with the route reflector. This is the most favorite uh, deployment for BGP VPN where you can scale, you can use, uh, it's a new network, so you can use the, the latest and greatest of VXLAN. You can also integrate your existing data center over the cloud, over the VAN, and you can use ASR 9000XS9Ks to terminate MP, MPLS uh, into VXLAN. You can also integrate VXLAN with OTV VPLS. And uh, with the DCI, this is, we have seen some customers using this, and it's going to, I guess, uh, get more popular where you have two different data centers and you want to connect them and you have your OTV VPLS. In this case, your eVPN domain are broken, meaning you have VPN domain for your data center. You need to do a handoff at the VLAN level and then you do a inter DC eVPN. So you have three levels of eVPN when you're connecting two sites. In this case, eVXN VPN is uniform, it extends throughout your both the data centers. So it's just one control plane domain extending in on both data center one and data center two. And you have your eBGP multi-hop, no need to do VXLAN handoff. You can have your uniform stretched eVPN across two data centers. A quick comparison on flood and learn and eVPN. Um, so the common points are, sorry, the distinguishing points are highlighted in the box where how the peer discovery and peer authentication happens and how the host uh, route learning happens. And also for the distribution, you need to rely on flood and learn. In BGP, it's control plane oriented using MP BGP VPN. So that brings to the last polling question for today. Um, I've been talking about VXLAN BGP VPN throughout the session, and I've been repeatedly saying that it's a standard-based solution, meaning a multi-vendor integration should be a possibility. So what are your thoughts? Is it, do you think it's work in progress? Do you think it's possible? Any, anyone having any solution guides, design guides showing this? How does multi-vendor solution? I mean, think about it right now in the industry, it's more about, um, it's more about openness, but it also then it's deployed in a certain way that it only works within your specific vendor and not multi-vendor. So what are your thoughts? Is it a multi-vendor or still a proprietary solution? So most of you said yes, which is very right. And this was, um, there was MPLS World Congress in Paris and multiple vendors participated. There's a good paper on this, on the actual design. So I would encourage to um, see this uh, uh, session, which was presented by Cisco, Juniper, Alcatel, Lucent, and IXIA for packet generation. And 
with VXN VPN, this is possible that you can have different choice of vendors and you can integrate using Nexus 9000 with other vendors to have multi-vendor solution for your data center fabric. So with that, I would uh, like to share some more resources on VXN. We have um, good configuration guides and a lot of YouTube videos from Cisco channel where it goes over VXN, MPBGP. We have a lot of Cisco live sessions on MPBGP, VXN, and also for DCI. So please uh, go through those resources. You have my email address. Also, we have Ask the Expert. So we can continue for next two weeks on any questions that you might have. And with this, I'll conclude the session for today. I'm open for any questions that you might have. Yes. Thank you, Vishal. Great, great presentation. Also, thanks to everyone for participating in the polling event. Now it's time to answer some of the technical questions that you have been asking. If you cannot stay with us through the Q&A, please be sure to click on the evaluation link that will appear when you close your window. Uh, your feedback is very, very important to us. So without further ado, let me just start the first, uh, the first question. Mm -hmm. um, it was a good, a good question, uh, so I, I thank the, the audience for, for being active on this. Uh, so the first question is, which Cisco platforms support BGP eVPN? Um, BGP eVPN, um, uh, it's Nexus 7000 with F3 9 card, or Nexus uh, 1000, not for a gateway perspe perspective, but for control plane. ASR 9000, I guess Nexus 3000, 3, 3132 series, 3200 series also supports BGP VPN. Okay. The next question is, in the hybrid model of VXLAN, can be provided by physical edge switches in addition to virtual switches as well? Uh, sorry, sorry, I did not get that question. Yeah, the question is: in the hybrid model of the VXLAN, can, mm -hmm. can the VXLAN can be provided by physical edge switches in addition to virtual switches? Yes, yes. So okay. that is uh, next, like for example, Nexus one thousand V in the virtual, and Nexus nine thousand in the physical. You can definitely have BGP VPN across them. Cool. Uh, the, next the next question is, which technologies can VXLAN replace or augment? Um, I would say uh, traditional um, technologies like LISP, Trill, Fabric Path, whatever they can solve, VXLAN can definitely solve that. So, yep. Okay. Now, the next question is, uh, does the NX9372 switches support VXLAN and eVPN? I will need to check the config guide uh, if 9372 supports or not. Uh, okay. Yeah. So let, let, let me ask Gunaras to pose that question on the Ask the Expert yeah. event yes. so I'll, that I'll, you can get yeah, the answer there. I think it does, but I want to give a definitive answer, so okay. definitely. The next question is, um, what are the key differentiating points for Cisco's BGP eVPN solution? Um, so from uh, Nexus 9000 point of view, you can have uh, the excellent routing, which because we have uh, our, the, the ASIC, which, which makes it unable to have the excellent routing. Also distributed Anycast gateway, you can have uh, layer two multipathing, BGP itself is a secure protocol, so on top of it, you can have BGP security. Um, ARP suppression, VPC, uh, you can also integrate your BGP VPN with VPC solution. So those are the differentiating uh, from vendor point of view, I would say that's, that's what Nexus 9000 solution stands out. Okay, cool. The next question is, is VXLAN support enabled in software? or does it require hardware or ASIC support and upgrade? Uh, no, it's, it's just sort of like, for example, uh, in uh, Nexus 7000, it's just a software patch and that you do and it's VXLAN is supported. With Nexus 9000, same thing. Whichever hardware is going to support um, VXLAN, 
you don't need um, any additional um, hardware changes. It's, it's a software upgrade and software license will take care of it. Okay, cool. Uh, the next question is, can the links be different, different speeds on a VXLAN? Can the links be different speeds on... A VXLAN. Uh, I will need to check on that. Uh, I guess it should because uh, it's a layer three uh, overlay, so it should not matter. But I'll I'll make a note of this question and uh, we can answer this and ask the expert. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, the next one is: Can I implement VXLAN as outer IP IP being IPv6 and inner IP being IPv4? So IPv6, uh, from a control pane point of view, I don't think, uh, actually, yes, you can. You can use IPv6, yes. Okay. Uh, the next question is, does VXLAN work across the MVPN and or a static IPsec encrypted one man link? I think, uh, I need to research on that. Okay, no problem. Um, do we still require multicast in the under underlay? Um, so from network fabric point of view, and yes and no. If yes, no for sure. If you're using BGP VPN and you want to get rid of multicast completely and you want to have your uh, unknown traffic, the bump traffic, to be unicast replicated, then yes, you don't need multicast at all. But for big scale networks where uh, flooding or, or unicast replication becomes a pain point, then we do recommend to have multicast to scale better for bump traffic. Okay, cool. Uh, so the next question is, can this solution be used to extend VLANs across data centers without the use of a, a, a 1000 V switch? Yes. Or do we do the virtual machines have to participate, or can they be obviously uh, obviously to the v, VXLAN? No. So you you don't need. Uh... So there are, there are two ways. You can use completely Nexus 1000 V to extend the VLAN. If you don't want to do that, then if your Tor switches, if say they are Nexus 9000 and they can support, uh, and they do support BGP VPN or any other Tor switches, which can do VXLAN, then you don't need to use or do anything on virtual machine for extension. So there are two options. Uh, but if you want to rely completely on the Tor switches, then that's absolutely fine. You don't need to have Nexus 1000 V. Okay. Because, and to add on that point, Nexus 9000, for example, can do both layer two and layer three gateway. Nexus 1000 V cannot do that. So if you want to do that, then you you need to rely on a, a new deployment of virtual machines, which can act as your gateways. And you need to also have CSR 1000 V that can do layer three gateway. I see. With Nexus 9000, it can do both, so that limits your extra configuration. Okay. Uh, the next question is, are there any specific differences between the Nexus 7000 and the Nexus 9000 platforms that will make the Nexus 9000 the better choice to run VXLAN? Um, from BGP VPN perspective, no. If you have Nexus 7000 F3 line card, it, from BGP VPN perspective, yeah, there is no um, no difference in the implementation. Okay. The next question is, uh, will Cisco add VXLAN support to the ASAs? ASA, as of now, that would be more specific to ASA people. I, I don't directly work with that product, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know that. I can I can ask the, my peers and I can get back on that. Okay. Okay, so the next one is, um, why you use VGP EVPN for VXLAN control plane? Um, so 
our, our entire session was uh, half of the session was based on why to use that. Just just to summarize, it, it's a it's a standard protocol for control plane. It has been in use for a very long time. It's a robust. Uh, our entire internet works on it. Uh, it is more secure. It ha it can do it can distribute both layer two and layer three reachability, and it can take off the burden of using multicast and using a pure control plane protocol without relying on any other controllers. Okay. Um, the next question is, how much performance improve on VXLAN compared to other overlay protocols? Uh, that would be a question for the other pro I mean, um, it would it would this answer would vary from hardware to hardware. Uh, my comparison points were on configuring and the the features that VXN brings in rather than at the performance level. So this question would would is would is a very wide uh, answer it has. It, it differs from protocol I mean from hardware to hardware. So I would I would say they focus more on the, on the features point of view, and and then if you need specific comparison, say LISP versus VXLAN, then you can reach out to specific Cisco your account specialist to give you that values on the performance. But from feature point of view, if you ask me, then I would say VXLAN stands out better than other protocols. Okay. Another question is, as far as I understood, the VTAP have all the host routes in their routing tables. How is this scalable challenge addressed? How, how this scalability challenge is being addressed? Uh, so this scalability, that's a very good question. Um, this scalability improves with every software. So if you, if you compare the different software versions on a specific hardware, you will see that it, it say for the supporting 100 end devices on Mac and IP address, and the latest version it might be supporting 1,000. So we are continuously working on improving the scalability, but uh, as such, there is no no termination of okay if uh, and also this are software limits. It it might support more, but to be on the safe side from our QA testing, we publish those scalability numbers. As of today, I'm not aware of any way to address this, but only I can tell you is that with every software version, of it, it, it gets better in terms of scalability. Okay. Um, another question is, can I have a spine and leaf node on a single N9372PX switch? No, 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 that's not possible. The, they are distinguished. There is a different hardware for spine and leaf, so you can't mix them. Okay. Can the Nexus 7000 with F3 line cards function an, as a layer 2, layer 3 VXLAN gateway? Yes. Okay. Uh, what is the purpose of a VRF overlay v, VLAN uh, SVI for the VRF and VNI? Mm -hmm. Sorry, can you please repeat let, that? Let me, yeah, 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 yeah. So what is the purpose of the VRF overlay, mm -hmm. VLAN SVI, mm -hmm. for the VRF VNI? For the VRF VNI, okay. So that is, when, when you need to route across the VX and VNIs, uh, you need to have the SVI on that specific VRF overlay VNI so that when the routing happens, that routed packet will use that SVI IP address as the source and the destination. So in, in order to route across the VXLAN, say you are going from VNI A to VNI B and you go through VNI X, it's that when you use your outer header will use those SVI IP addressing. Okay. Another question related to VTAPs is how many VTAPs are supported on the Nexus 9000 with flood and learn and eVPN options? Uh, let me just give me a few seconds. I'll 
get it from the scalability. It's, it's listed on our scalability guide um, for for both the options. So just give me one minute. So it's 256. 256, perfect. And we have time for like three more questions. So if you have a couple more questions, we can still, uh, you can still pose them. In the meantime, uh, here's another question. Uh, if I have a primary data center with two Nexus 9372 mm -hmm. that, that are VPC peers, mm -hmm. and I have a back of DC with another two Nexus 9372s also with VPCs, Mm -hmm. The question is, can I have a valid VXLAN DCI solution with EBGP between both data centers? Yes. Yes, you can. Okay. Um, let me see. Do we have anything left? Uh, hold on. Uh, Is VXLAN supported between uh, Nexus 9000s if one of the Nexus 1000 is connected to a fax? Um, so with the fax, as as of today, uh, so fax uses v, VN tag encapsulation. And uh, so using both encapsulation of VN tag, encapsulation decapsulation of VN tag, and VXLAN on the same box is not supported as of today, but that is subjected to change. So, uh, yeah, as of today, it's not supported. Okay. Now, there is another question about the speed and the uh, throughput uh, to encap and decap VXLAN in a typical data center mm -hmm. going through load ba balancers. The question is, can you compare VXLAN to FP? Can I can can you uh, can, 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 can you compare VXLAN to FP? I will think it will mean a forward path. Oh uh, no, fabric path. Can you? Uh, okay, can we uh, can we post this question and ask the expert so that I can give a, a research on this and I and get back. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Yes, we will do that. And um, I think. Uh, I think these are all the questions. So yeah. thank you, thank you very much, everyone. As you know, we are going. Uh, you can pose all your questions that didn't get answered, or m more questions on the Q and on the FAQ uh, on the upcoming as the expert event. It is open now, so feel free to start posting your questions now. Uh, Vishal will be available until next Friday, October 30 to answer your questions. Okay. Uh, if you haven't already logged into the Cisco support community recently, we encourage you to do so. We have a brand new look and feel, uh, and you can start sharing today. We have a wide variety of social media channels that you can subscribe, and you also can subscribe to the newsletter, and we encourage you to do so because then this is where you can get a lot of the news about uh, the upcoming events, etc., and all the links are posted on the chat. If you are bilingual and you speak either Spanish, Portuguese, Japanese, Russian, or Chinese, you are welcome to also participate in the local communities. Uh, you can get through this by, by going to any of these links that are on the chat or by going to the Cisco support community and go to the language pull down menu, menu on top and selecting the language that you desire. Uh, looking for, uh, if you are looking for more information on IT and technical training, you can log into the Cisco Learning Network and take advantage of the technical webinars that they offer. Uh, if, if you are interested, you can go to the Cisco Learning Network webinars located in the in link in the chat. By the way, there was a question of, about e-learnings uh, for data center. You can also go there to find uh, the answer to that. And then last but not least, I would really like to encourage you to uh, provide us with your feedback. 
we take it very seriously, especially the, the, the topics that you want to hear next. So when we close this uh, session or when you close your browser, you should get a pop-up uh, survey and it will take you just a couple of minutes for you to fill out. And then as an appreciation for you attending to this event, uh, we are giving you a 35% discount offer on the Cisco Press by going to the link there and, and entering the code CSC uh, when you are ready to check out for any books. And the link is in the chat. And this concludes to our, our session today. Thank you to Vishal for sharing his expertise with us today and thank you to all the, to everyone for attending and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.